Hi everyone and welcome to this week's IMAX FinTech Market Insight. Uh, as usual, we start off with our disclaimer that trading involves the potential risk of loss of capital, not suitable for everyone, hopefully for you though. Uh, and if there's leverage involved, just be aware you can lose substantially more than that initial investment that you make. Uh, these days it's more difficult, but that doesn't mean it's impossible. It depends on your regulations, you know, where, which broker you're using, such like, so be careful. Uh, the views, opinions, all the other information contained in these are purely for educational purposes. We are not trying to uh, encourage you to trade or invest. That has to be your decision. And of course, you should carefully consider the risks, your financial situation, definitely your level of experience and your risk appetite. You should only risk capital you're prepared, but more importantly, that you can afford to lose. You know, make sure you've got at least enough to cover a lot of costs for a lot of months. Uh, you know, just use a small percentage of your capital. Uh, and if you've got any doubts whatsoever, seek independent financial advice before risking your capital, please. Okay, so let's look at what happened last week. Uh, yep, mixed earnings results. Uh, Musk has said that he'll probably cut up to 75% of the staff at Twitter uh, if he finally ends up buying the company. Uh, it seems more likely he will. Uh, perhaps he realised he was going to lose the court case. I don't know. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's got to finish at some stage. Uh, I've started with the UK this week, uh, but you know, let's, let's again just look at some of the, the bits and pieces before that. So stocks were a bit steadier. Uh, the US did, USD was steady, off of its highs, but still quite steady considering everything that's going on. Uh, BTC still ranging. So, you know, it's, it's strange. Bitcoin almost has become more stable than, than plenty of the other asset classes. Uh, gold again, sort of uh, in the mid 1600s, and WTI in the mid 80s, all towards the end of last week. So earnings were a bit mixed. Uh, jobless claims have started to increase, but only slightly. Uh, and you know, I'm going to start with the UK just because it's been such a traumatic week politically. I mean, the last month hasn't been much fun for investors anyway. Uh, but, you know, there's there's so much more political chaos happening uh, and it's not over yet. Uh, another PM's gone. Uh, so uh, Liz Truss uh, resigned. Uh, you know, for me, it's a disaster uh, for UK politics. Uh, I'm in the UK, so it obviously impacts me, but it's just bad to see this. Uh, so with the PM gone, obviously, you know, for me, the Tories were being manipulated from the shadows. Uh, and it's now looking like Sunak versus Boris Johnson. Uh, and, and for me, unless Boris is reinstated, uh, then I think that the public should demand and, and quite honestly, uh, should be offered a general election. Uh, you know, or keep changing the... Uh, prime minister like you do the bed sheets just doesn't make sense to me uh, and it's not fair you know you've got to get behind one and stick with it if it's a leader uh, you help them rather than try and stab them in the back so UK politics and especially the conservatives I think have been acting disgracefully this year uh, and it, you know it, it's it's going to come back and really hurt them when it comes to the next elections, whether it's soon or two years from now. Now, inflation itself remains high, and you know, with the adjustments being made by the current Chancellor uh, Hunt, uh, we're going to see further spikes in inflation in the UK, probably October, November, and, and, and even after next April, uh, and that's based around the energy caps. Uh, we just had the energy cap raised this month and it will raise again uh, after April. It was supposed to be uh, in place for two years, but 
Uh, when Hunt came in as chancellor, he, he reduced that from two years to six months. Uh, and it aligns with the industry as well, because they've only got a price freeze for six months. So as I mentioned, you know, uh, in, in previous uh, broadcasts that I've done YouTube recently, that I still see this divergence between PPI and CPI. You know, with PPI month for month lower in the UK, yet CPI still high. Uh, and I believe that's because companies are not passing on any cost savings at the moment. Uh, however, that said, consumers remain quite resilient in the UK. Uh, and, you know, now we're sort of leading up to Christmas uh, in the UK. We do love to spend money generally even more so uh, when it comes to Christmas. Uh, moving on to the US. Now, uh, data was still strong. Uh, capacity utilization still above 80, which indicates growth still. So that's always a good one to look at. Between 80 and 84 uh, means that there's, you know, it's solid, solid demand in the economy. Of course, if it spikes when it's above 80, then, you know, don't expect the markets to necessarily rally because that again sort of triggers the central banks to come in and raise rates. And, and obviously they don't need any encouragement at the moment. Now, obviously, on top of that, we are moving into the midterm uh, elections in the U.S., uh, and of course, because of that, Biden, well, I'm not saying because of that, but it probably was, that Biden's releasing yet more oil reserves where he's trying to manipulate and reduce the oil prices, which in turn will then uh, reduce the gasoline prices, which is obviously going to hope for leading up to the election uh, that it will gain him some votes. Uh, it just seems to be Biden versus OPEC plus at the moment. You know, they're cutting production, so he's increasing. But, you know, OPEC's cut by 2 million barrels per day and, and adding 15 million barrels sounds a lot, but it's like seven days, eight days of OPEC cut. So is it really? Uh, but, you know, that if he can get the pump prices down, that's obviously he thinks that's going to be a little bit more in his favour with the voters. But, of course, it, it's not going to be the only thing because in inflation levels, are so high still that, you know, it, it, the Democrats could easily lose one or, or both the houses in the vote on the 8th of November. Uh, and then when we look at the EU, so inflation, uh, just a whisker under 10%. Confidence levels remain low. Uh, but of course, this week, we've got the ECB meeting. Uh, and again, you know, we've got to expect an increase there. It seems as, uh, to me at the moment, just remember, this is always just me uh, rather than anything else uh, providing all of this information and views, definitely, uh, that uh, the ECB, BOE and, and the Fed at their next meetings, they're all probably going to look at raising by 75 basis points. <laughs> of course, at the moment, things can change very quickly, but that does seem to be the way things are heading at the moment. But, you know, if confidence is low in Europe, uh, understandably so at the moment. Uh, with China, uh, they kept their rate unchanged at 3.65. Uh, Japan data was better than expected, uh, with inflation slightly lower, 3%. Uh, you know, what wouldn't other central banks around the world give to get inflation at just under 3% at the moment. In New Zealand, CPI inflation was higher, 7.2%, just to, you know, just sort of brings it home. Uh, and Canada, CPI was higher as well. Uh, so, you know, they both still have a bit of work to do at the moment. So moving on to this week, uh, there should be more earnings coming out. So just keep an eye on them. You know, it's going to impact the stock sectors for sure. Uh, plenty of data this week. And of course, we, we need to start watching for those GDP releases as, as well to, to see, you know, what's got, been going on in that last quarter. Of course, we've got a really strong idea, but we still want to see those results. 
Uh, so in the US, we've got lots of data. We've got manufacturing, consumer confidence, housing data, durable goods. You know, they're the bigger ticket products. So if people are still spending there. It shows that people are comfortable making those larger outlays. Our personal consumption expenditure uh, plus uh, personal income and spending. But the key is that personal consumption expenditure, the PCE. It's one of the key metrics for Powell and the Fed. Uh, and of course, we've got GDP. Now we've seen in the in the last in the, sort of the last two quarters they've been slightly negative. So the US in a technical recession. However, a technical recession and a real recession are very different. Um, and you know if, if the US is in a technical recession, then God help the rest of us is all I can say. They still have the strongest economy by far. But just keep an eye on that GDP data because it will impact the markets and the dollar. Uh, so when we look at the UK again, there's not too much in the way of data, but we're not going to need it this week. Uh, it's quite possible we'll even get our new prime minister named this week. You know, when you elect a party and effectively the prime minister, the whole country does that. Uh, and, and then because we've been switching prime ministers, uh, it then went down to being like only the party members that voted. And now we've reduced it even more to only the politicians voting, the Tory politicians at that, not all of them, just the own party ones, the Tory party. So the selection's getting less and less which you know eventually ends up horse trading as far as I'm concerned, which is not a good outcome. Uh, and as I say, I, I think really this country deserves a general election. Uh, with the EU, uh, again, we are still seeing plenty of data, but negative data, consumer sentiment. Uh, and of course, this week we're going to see some German IFO sentiment. So that's going to be interesting because they haven't been performing very well either. And we've got some CPIs coming out. Uh, again, those confidence and sentiment uh, indicators are very useful. Uh, and of course, we've got uh, members CPI and GDP coming out from some of the EU members. China, we've got GDP. So again, keep an eye on that because of these lockdowns that they've been doing. Uh, and industrial production, we've got retail sales, and obviously the trade balance is an important one for China. Uh, and then moving on to Australia, inflationary data, CPI, PPI, Bank of Japan rate decision this week, said Canada rate decision, and for Canada also GDP. So Looking at the macro outlook, not massive changes. Uh, some of it's just geopolitical stuff again. You know, uh, they just come back and, and haunt us every so often, uh, especially investors, because, you know, they're holding on to these long term positions. And of course, the focus is going to be on the UK. And also, we're getting much closer to the US midterm elections. Uh, inflation. State inflation, stagflation, you know, countries are already seeing stagflation, you know, it's that inflation without growth. Uh, and, you know, this inflation remains stubborn. Uh, we've got companies holding on to any savings that are being made from lower costs, uh, hence why the PPI is maybe dropping slightly, but the CPI isn't because uh, they're not passing those savings on to the consumers. Uh, and again, as I just mentioned, GDP data will start to provide some further insight into the economies. But just remember, when it comes to GDP, it's very lagging. You know, this is data that's been accumulated over the last three months. Uh, and then, of course, when we move on to interest rates, uh, you know, we've got some great central banks uh, meetings coming up, ECB this week, uh, followed by obviously Bank of England and uh, the Fed in March, November, sorry. Now, recession wise, <laughs> for me, it's just a case of when, not if. Sure, you know, the US are in a stronger position and, you know, I, I don't expect that to change anytime soon. 
but you know, you've got to expect this recession as far as I'm concerned. Now, the US may get away with a shallow one because they're probably going to be the last in and probably the first out because it's just the way it happens. Uh, whereas for the EU and the UK, uh, we could be in much sooner and stay in much longer and go much deeper. Part of that could even depend on the weather. You know, we're entering winter. So, you know, are we going to see those uh, temperatures drop? And which would mean that we would have to uh, go deeper into the reserves that have been created in recent months. Uh, supply chain continue to improve. However, you know, these lockdowns in China due to their zero COVID policy do remain a danger. Uh, and of course, you know, we're, we're seeing COVID cases increase around the world. Uh, you know, Omicron, uh, different versions of it, plenty of different versions of it indeed. But uh, at the moment, fingers crossed, touch wood, uh, none of them have been a, a, a serious contender for uh, the Delta virus, thankfully. Uh, and of course, when we look at other things that are going on. Uh, Xi is now uh, premier in, in China for life. Um, uh, so yeah, uh, Russia invasion uh, of Ukraine, the conflict continues, you know, eight months, incredible. Uh, uh, but it's great to see that Ukraine have been gaining ground. Uh, and, you know, they're, they're pretty much as, as far as a sort of if I've got it right, they're, they're pretty much on the borders of these four territories that were annexed by Putin now. Uh, and, you know, let's hope that they continue and, and sort of get in there. Obviously, it's coming at more of a cost. They're getting some of their major cities uh, sort of more sort of randomly uh, attacked uh, with missiles these days, uh, which, you know, is not good because that means more and more civilians are dying. Uh, and obviously more and more damage. I mean, a lot, I think it's 25 or 50 percent or something of their uh, power supplies are being cut. You know, their, their reactors and uh, all the various ways that they're keeping their uh, electricity and their power on. So uh, again, maybe they've just been targeted. But, you know, maybe a lack of weapons uh, may come into play there. Uh, Again, you know, each each country is, is getting support from one way or another. Uh, but uh, apart from weapons, with winter coming on, you know, will conditions get too cold, too difficult for them to continue the war? Will they go into sort of a war freeze, if you like? I don't know. However, energy prices, you know, uh, They've elevated sort of uh, to high prices, but then they've sort of come back down again. So, you know, once the, once Russia went into Ukraine, I mean, prices just exploded. Uh, but they went off from the highs now. Uh, and of course, you know, the thing is that the, a lot of the energy companies are dramatically increasing profits because of that. Uh, again, it comes back to these companies not really passing on any benefits to the consumer. Uh, but of course, it will depend on Russia uh, and also the temperatures in Europe as we go forward for energy prices. Food prices, uh, they should be lower based on transport costs dropping uh, and other raw material costs dropping. Uh, as I say, companies are just so keen to keep them. You look in the supermarkets, nothing seems to be going down in price. Uh, you know, we're still being slightly brainwashed, I would think, by saying that inflation is, is with us and going to stay with us, which means that we accept these very high price increases more readily. Um, and again, as I keep mentioning, you can see that through PPI versus CPI. Uh, uh, again, another area that I've mentioned in the past, uh, and I'm going to mention it again, is jobs. Now, you know, I, I see that job offers are going to start to disappear. Wage demands will evaporate. Uh, everyone's just going to be keen to cling on to what jobs they've got as, as we sort of go into this recession. Uh, 
Now, the interesting thing here is going to be are firms going to drop their staff or are they, they, they might be reluctant to because look how difficult it's been for them to actually gain the work of the skilled workers that they've needed. Uh, so they may try and absorb some of those costs, uh, you know, hopefully, because that means that less people will be put out of work. But we'll have to wait and see. Uh, and of course, we still need to watch COVID. Uh, it, you know, COVID, Omicron is still mutating, and it's just going to be a matter of, you know, whether uh, it becomes more aggressive. Hopefully, if it stays as it is, it, it's, you know, it's still not nice to get, but uh, it's, it's definitely a better version than the Delta was for sure. So trading tip of the week, trading plan. Uh, do you guys all have a trading plan? What is a trading plan? Quite simply, it's a set of rules to keep you safe and hopefully it will help you develop consistency. You know, that's what we all want and that's what pro traders have more than most is consistency. Now, for me, a trading plan uh, has two parts to it. Uh, and uh, the first part I would say is the financial area. So, you know, you've got to think to yourself, how much of your capital are you prepared to risk? And of course, you know, you don't want to make that a massive part of your capital. You know, you need those reserves. So be careful how much you consider for that. And of course, you know, how much you're going to risk in each of your positions. Uh, you know, you've got to maintain that risk reward level. And of course, maximum drawdowns per trade, per day, per week, per month, per quarter, uh, etc. So there's a, a lot to take in there. But you know, that for me, that's part one is the financial element of trading. The second part, which is much deeper, it's a, it, well, deeper. It's much more around the trade in itself. Uh, and of course, you know, with a trading plan, you've got to have a solid trading strategy anyway just doing things the same day in, day out. If you haven't got a solid trading strategy, it's still not gonna work for you. So hopefully you're developing that trading strategy or you already have. Uh, and that is going to help you. And to help you even more, you create a routine. You know, you read your reports, you uh, look at the data, you do your analysis. Uh, and of course, then you come up with, you know, your ideas and, and your levels and, and you know, that's part one of, of the trading element, you know, limiting the number of trades you do uh, and also the number of products perhaps as well. And of course, no revenge trading. You know, if you have a loss, just accept it as a business cost um, and then just look for the next opportunity. You know, we all take losses. So, you know, never sort of fear them, uh, just control them. Uh, and of course, then setting rules, restops for the day. Uh, it, you know, when it comes to having that control for stopping yourself out on the day, you should also have a set of rules around when to stop trading when you're in profit as well. Um, and, and again, you know, reach out to me. I can help you with all of these areas. Uh, we're always available. Uh, you know, I'd love to help people. Uh, and uh, you know, if you want to do a session with me, whether it's a, a couple of hours or a day or something like that, I can really help you to develop these much faster than you can on your own. So we're going to move on to the core analysis now. Uh, and as usual, I'll just give you uh, a little reminder here. So uh, when we look in the right axis, uh, of the chart, the black numbers are support and resist resistance levels. Uh, if there's a blue number and unless it's a pivot, that is going to be the last traded price that happened on Friday. Brown numbers are breakout levels um, and claret numbers, uh, they're just sort of horizontal lines that I've put in where I can either see support or resistance or I feel that's where it is. Uh, or it's based on double or triple tops or bottoms. Uh, and then uh, Fibonacci colors are on the right. 
So as usual, we're going to start with the Dow daily. Um, I've got resistance here at 31,292, uh, and then support at 29.737 but for me there's also that other downtrend line there which is going to be quite pivotal uh, for the opening because it's at 307.99 now please remember first all of this is based on futures secondly I recalled this uh, late on a Sunday but before the markets reopen uh, so that we can get it out to you early Monday morning so it helps you to set up for next week. Uh, when we look on the 30 minutes, so Friday the markets had a good recovery. They closed at the highs on Friday. Uh, so again, a little bit of investor confidence coming in, but you know, is it going to be short lived? Uh, so I've got uh, on the 30 minute, I've got resistance at 31,202 and support at 3877 and 3256. With the S&P, uh, the top one's just a reminder, you know, it's nowhere near there at the moment, but it's a key level for me. Uh, I loved it when it got up there in August. It gave me a great opportunity to buy put options. Uh, if it gets up there again, I'm going to be doing the same thing for sure. But, you know, we're quite a way away from that at the moment. So it's going to take a bit of time. But I leave it on there as a little bit of a reminder. And below that, we've got 39.12, 38.19 and 37.77. On the support side, 35.88. Moving on to the S&P, uh, on the 30 minute, we've got 37.73 as resistance, very much where it sort of closed. Uh, and then uh, below that uh, support, I've got 37.54 and 37.12. Uh, and as you can see on Friday, that S1 level worked really well. Uh, and, and it was a great level. So good support level. Uh, and then we're going to move on to NASDAQ. Uh, and, and again, uh, I'm going to look at the daily first. So just as a reminder, I've got 13.583 as resistance, uh, but then much lower down. I've got 12.148 and 11.766 based on those trend lines. Uh, support at 10,942 and 10,659. Now with the NASDAQ 30 minutes, I've also uh, left the pivots on there so you can see how the market reacted to them on Friday. You know, again, if you're not into pivots, perhaps you should be. Uh, you can always reach out. I'm happy to do a session on pivot points, how to use them. Uh, professionally and efficiently and as you can see it came down on Friday it touched that S1 beautifully bounced away from that and look how high it went from there so on the 30 minutes I've got resistance at 11.390 and 11.385 uh, and I've got support at 11.292 and 10.935 The Russell, uh, just remember these are small and mid cap stocks. Uh, I've got resistance at 1782 and support at 1679. On the 30 minute, I've got resistance at 1767, 1754-1751. Uh, support at 17.43 and at 17.20. So I'd expect to break out from those come Monday or definitely next week for sure. You can always pause this and either take a screenshot or 
take a photo on your phone of this analysis just to sort of bear in mind for next week. Uh, of course, with our uh, daily newsletter that we provide, uh, we give you new levels, we give you fresh levels each day. So, uh, and of course the pivots, fresh daily pivots each day. So, you know, if you haven't signed up already, then do so. Uh, details are on the last slide. So moving on to a couple of the currencies. So cable, obviously, you know, this week has been political chaos in the UK um, and investors are very wary of the UK at the moment and who can blame them. Uh, the big question's going to be, is it going to be Sunak or Boris? Uh, and of course, it, it, you know, whatever you can expect, another volatile week for the pound. So on the daily, I've got resistance at 115.15. I've got resistance at 113.33 with support at 1.0772. Got a little downtrend there, uh, which probably is, is sort of merited at the moment, considering the disaster we're having in the UK. Uh, resistance on the 30 minute, I've got 113.51 uh, and then the second one sort of is in line with the daily which is at 113.32. Uh, I've got a better support line though at 110.42. Uh, when we look at the Euro, uh, Again, you know, things aren't so rosy in Europe at the moment. And of course, we've got the ECB meeting this week where I, emphasis on I, am expecting a 75 basis point rate hike. Uh, and again, on, on Friday, you know, we've got resistance at 0 0.9941 and support on the daily at 0 0.9716. On the 30 minute, I've got uh, a resistance line just above, not too far above where it closed at 0.9912. I've got support at 0 0.9805, support at 0 0.9798. Um, and also I've added in the pivot points on a, a fresh chart for you here so that you can see how well that S2 held on Friday and the opportunities it gave. You know, if you follow that for Friday, that last part of the chart, we ran it up and we hit the resist, uh, sorry, we hit the pivot point level, that solid blue line. We dropped down to S2 uh, and then we bounced all the way through uh, and made it through R1 and we closed midpoint between R1 and R2 really. So again, you know, just emphasis on these pivot points. If you're not using them, you know, they've been used by pro traders for absolute decades. Uh, Bitcoin daily, you know, Bitcoin just seems to almost become the most stable asset class of all of them at the moment. It's just ranging. I mean, just look at that. Uh, and so I've got uh, resistance at 2570 and support at 18445. Uh, and of course, emphasis, it's ranging at the moment, but obviously it's not going to stay there forever. Uh, and then when we look at the 30 minute, I've seen some levels, 19,340 resistance, 19,245 resistance and 18,910 support. Now, you know, this sort of demonstrates the difference between the stocks and, and, and Bitcoin at the moment. You know, you can see pretty much, OK, yeah, there's a, a range there, but it is sort of it's just moving side to side uh, when you look at the red one, which is Bitcoin. Whereas when you look at the stocks, it, it's all over the place. It's much more volatile. So for me, you know, I wouldn't say at the moment the correlation is holding very well. Um, and, you know, it, it's a loose relationship anyway, but it seems even looser at the moment. You know, as I say, Bitcoin seems the more stable of the two. Moving on to commodities uh, with gold. On the daily, I've got this downtrend line that I've added. Uh, resistance at 17.02, support at 15. 
Moving on to the 30 minute, again, I've left the pivots on there. Uh, we've got a uh, resistance at 16.63 and support at 16.57 and 16.23. So very tight, so expect to break out from that for sure. Uh, you know, gold's been volatile. Uh, just look at the range on, on Friday, you know, it dropped all the way down to test S1. Uh, and then bounced all the way up to test uh, R2. So, you know, both ends of the, the levels there for three, you know, four out of the five uh, pivot levels. Okay, and then uh, finally, we move on to WTI. Now, you know, as I mentioned earlier, if you've watched all of my uh, YouTube, uh, the macro part as well, Biden's releasing 15 million barrels to try and push the oil prices lower uh, because he's got these midterm elections coming up um, and he wants to try and get inflation down. He wants to try and get gasoline prices lower. Uh, but, you know, voters are not going to ignore inflation. So, you know, it is, there's the potential of that. Uh, he could lose control of both the houses, if not at least one of them. Uh, and of course, it seems to me, and I'm pretty sure that he's very uh, anti-fracking as well. And of course, that reduces the supply uh, that the US have available. Uh, you know, I, I mean, before fracking, I mean, the US was quite a substantial importer of oil. After the fracking industry really took off in the States, uh, they become a net exporter. And if things had continued the way they were going, they could have possibly even challenged the Saudis as a number one exporter. Uh, you know, correct me if I'm wrong there, but that's the way I see it. Uh, but of course, uh, if you sort of control that fracking and you won't allow so much, you know, it is controversial. So I can understand part of that. But, you know, it is perhaps having a, a little bit of a uh, push on the prices. Uh, you know, he, he announced that he's going to add more uh, those these 15 million barrels. Uh, and of course, the oil price went up rather than down. So what does that tell you? Uh, okay, so moving on to resistance levels, 95.98 and 89.73 for resistance. Support on the daily at 79.37. So yeah, very wide them up now with 30 minutes. I've got 86.28 as a resistance level, 83.82 as support and 82.33 as support. Now please remember that my analysis is based on futures. You know trading futures is, is much more accessible these days than, than most people think. You know, the CP, uh, sorry, the CME, they've, they've got their micro and their mini contracts uh, to help to cater for those investors and traders that have got smaller capital amounts to risk. Uh, and of course, you know, uh, if you want more information on that, just let me know or just go on to the websites of some of these exchanges. OK, so just moving on to uh, obviously do a little bit of insight into what we provide in the way of services. So uh, obviously we provide this each week to help prepare you for the week ahead. We've got a daily newsletter, which includes all the global news, uh, my up-to-date views, along with up-to-date chart levels and fresh pivot point levels. Uh, we provide one day workshops to help you to improve any areas where you would like to. Uh, we and, and obviously we do one trading for beginners as well for those that are fresh uh, looking to enter the market so that we can help them to understand the right way to get into trading. Uh, and then we do one week uh, intensive courses to help people go from zero to hero. Really sort of by the end of that week, you feel comfortable with making some decisions so that you can start your trading journey. Uh, and then uh, if you want that sort of full blown on, you know, turn it into a career style uh, course, then we do our master classes, uh, which include four weeks of guided learning. They don't 
have to all be taken consecutively. You can split them up so that you can practice in between, which you'll be surprised. It really accelerates the learning curve. Uh, and then trade and mentoring, you know, maybe you're doing OK, but you would like to reach that next level. I can certainly help you with that. Uh, we consult to companies uh, to help them manage their exposure to currencies, commodities and such like. Uh, and of course, we provide trader education to individuals. We also provide content to exchanges and to brokers. Uh, and you know, as usual, feel free to reach out to us at info at cymaxfintech.com or if you've got any trading questions that you would like to aim directly at me, then my details are there, chris.tubby at cymax-int.com. Uh, and all it says, last of all for me, is have a great week. Uh, really look forward to the ECB meeting. Just remember, lots of data out this week, so you're going to see market moves. Uh, markets are volatile. Uh, you know, we're in the last quarter now, so we're in the home run. Uh, we've got those sort of uh, geopolitical issues going on, Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Uh, the UK politics absolutely in chaos. Uh, and then on top of that, we've got the US midterm uh, elections coming up uh, early next month. So as I say, have a great week and I look forward to seeing you next week. Bye for now.